seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this uh, festival of the church here, Pentecost Sunday. Glad that you're here. Also, welcome to those of you who have joined us uh, live streaming from the sanctuary of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Princeton, Minnesota. Glad that you could have joined us. Uh, once again, thank you for your ongoing contributions for the work and ministry of Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Uh, today is a service of Holy Communion. Just to remind those online to uh, have your bread and wine or grape juice ready. And for those of you who are gathered, uh, Communion Station will be center here. And uh, we'll begin with the front pew moving our way to the back of, of the sanctuary. Uh, and then there'll be two stations of wine so you can go in either, either direction. Um, please take time to uh, visit our fundraising display for technology committee in the gathering space as they continue to raise money for the projectors and screens for the sanctuary. And also there is a bin out in the gathering space to uh, receive food items for those who are homeless staying at the Rum River Motel. Um, and the need is primarily for microwavable food or food items that can be easily prepared. Uh, there also, uh, there is a bin in the, in the gathering space uh, for the uh, candy that we are asking volunteers to donate for the Rum River Parade, that we will have a presence in the parade this year. And so I ask that you... Uh, last time we did this, we had a fantastic response and uh, had uh, probably more than enough candy. Well, you never have enough candy, but almost, I mean, pretty close. So thank you again for your uh, generous uh, donation there. Um, I think the food items are in the cart, not a bin. So um, the sign-ups uh, for service ministry... Uh, we're doing that once again to sign up for worship leadership as a reader or a greeter or an usher. And that sign up is on the podium right next to the library door. So um, I know that, that we've had two so far. So it would be nice to see that filled up. So um, the flowers uh, behind the lectern uh, this morning are given by Bob and Chris Sandberg in celebration of the marriage of Dylan and, Joe and Cody uh, that took place yesterday. So congratulations to them. Uh, today we recognize and uh, remember in our prayers Olivia Rose who will be receiving her first communion today. So congratulations to Olivia. Um, next Sunday we begin our sermon series called Let It Go, a three-week series on forgiveness. Um, just so you know, as, as you've come in, uh, hopefully you, all, you already picked up the, the, the booklet, Now the Feast, on um, many of the Sundays on, on Sunday morning, uh, many of the Sundays throughout the summer, uh, rather, uh, we will be using that. And the alternative service we'll be using will be, uh, in place of liturgy, um, some of the hymns, like the hymn of praise and other places. But uh, for today, we're going to start with a now the feast, uh, Marty Haugen's uh, Holy Communion setting. And um, it's, it's not the, the easiest, but it is very beautiful, very beautiful. So by the end of the summer, we'll all be in just wonderful form uh, at the end of all that. Uh, but thank you for the leadership here who will to guide us through that service this morning. Um, the council on Thursday had decided uh, to go with the uh, lifting the restrictions for masks for those of you who are vaccinated. Um, you do not have to wear a mask. I look around and, and everybody's gotten the memo already, so I don't probably have to say anything. So at any rate, just to let you know that. Uh, we continue our uh, service with the, with the creed and ask you to please stand and follow along. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. you. 
In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For your people here who have come to give you praise, for the strength to live your word, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. And defend us, O oh God. Amen. Now the feast and celebration, all of creation sings for joy to the God of all. And give and us language, language to proclaim your gospel, gospel through, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Lord who lives and, lives and reigns with, with you in the Holy Spirit, Spirit one God, God, now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the reading. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. 
And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elites, and residents of Macedonia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, ah, they're drunk, filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these people are not drunk as you propose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and young, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption and the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. So also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer, 
about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks we'll be to you. God. We'll Maybe be seated. Though. So today is uh, Pentecost Sunday. It's a great celebration of the church here. Actually, it's a celebration of the birth of the church. And what we celebrate is the spirits coming upon uh, the people who are gathered in Jerusalem a long time ago. 2,000 years ago, the spirit descended upon people and uh, had received that spirit. And uh, a strange thing happened that uh, they could each, as they were speaking different languages, people who had gathered in Jerusalem could suddenly understand them and understand the power of God. Now, I want to say a little bit about the Spirit, that we don't say enough about the Spirit today or in our day. Uh, and to help illustrate, I brought a mirror along. Uh, in Genesis, we have uh, two different accounts at creation. Um, the one account, the first account of creation is God speaks and things come into being. And the second account, God takes stuff from the ground and like a master potter, he, he forms the man and, and breathes into that, that sculpture, you might say, um, the breath of life and becomes, that man becomes a living being. Now, what is common in both of these creation accounts are two things. One is God is a creator, and the second is the Spirit is present. In the first account, it says that the Spirit moved over the waters, and then uh, God, and the chaos of the waters, again, God brought order from that chaos. And in the second account, uh, as I mentioned, the Spirit breathes into the nostrils of the man, the breath of life, and the man uh, becomes this living being. Now, the mirror I, I brought along is wants to show you a little trick, and that is, and some of you have probably done this before, you take this mirror, but first, before I, I give the little trick, just, you know, if you take a mirror at home, you can, you can look, at your, look at yourself and say, um, like in Genesis, you are created in the image of God, not in the exact likeness in terms of physical likeness because God is invisible but as we look at ourselves we can be reminded that yes we're made in God's image but the trick here's the trick that comes and that is you breathe on that mirror you could see the spirit well not really but that's the evidence of the spirit that breath on the mirror just like when the wind blows, you can see evidence of the Spirit when the leaves blow. And so every time you go outside, every time you breathe on the mirror, you can see evidences of the Spirit. And knowing that God gives life to us and God gives life to the earth. Um, yesterday was a big deal in our lives. And, and if I don't break down, then it's probably going to be a miracle. It's the Spirit's bidding that I don't break down right now. But we got to see our grandson for the first time. And uh, you know that when a child is born, uh, the first thing the doctor wants to know is, uh, is the child breathing. That's important. The breath means that child is living. And uh, if the child isn't, isn't breathing, and some of you know this, um, I, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they smack the baby on the bottom. And then the, there'd be a scream. The doctor wasn't being mean. It's just to know that 
the child was breathing because that was evidence of that breath of life. And so it is that God gives each of us that breath of life, that uh, we come into being just like that first man, and when God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, so too we receive that life. And so we give God thanks for that new life that we've been given. Thanks be to God. First of all, I have to turn my phone off. It keeps dinging on me. Yep. It'd be embarrassing if it just rang in the middle. Already is embarrassing. So the Sunday school class was learning all about the Apostles' Creed and the class uh, room, they were, the students were gathered around the table. And uh, they were all uh, reciting the creed. And then one Sunday the pastor came and um, had asked uh, what they were doing. And uh, said, well, what are you working on? And said, well, we're, we're, we're uh, looking at the Apostles' Creed. And each of us has memorized a part of it. So, oh, great. Well, let's hear it. And so they started going around the room and they're all reciting a portion of the creed. When suddenly there was a pause, this abrupt ending to that recitation of the, of the creed. And the pastor said, well, what happened? You were doing so well. Why, why aren't you continuing? And one of the students at the table said, well, the boy who believes in the Holy Spirit, well, he's not here today. You know, at first, this might sound like uh, quite funny, but in actuality, there is some truth to that. I think we've forgotten uh, about the Holy Spirit and our, our thinking and our theology and in our prayers. We tend to neglect the important work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Now, what's true, I think, of the Holy Spirit can also be true of of Pentecost itself, that, um, that uh, for generations we know that the church had celebrated Pentecost as one of the great feasts or festivals of the church, along with uh, Easter and Epiphany. That's right. Christmas was not one of the major festivals of the church until later on in Christian history. It was Easter, Epiphany, and Pentecost were the major feast days. But unfortunately, it seems like in this day and age, this uh, celebration of Pentecost has fallen into hard times. It's fallen into obscurity. Well, these festivals, these festivals come up on an annual basis, and so we become quite familiar with the stories that go along with them. And if familiarity doesn't exactly breed contempt, then our tendency to want to domesticate uh, these stories in Scripture, uh, we do so. The incarnation, the resurrection, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh are important stories. But we toned them down a bit, haven't we? Because we become so familiar with them. These quiet images. Baby in a manger. The bunny in a basket. You know, we convert, Or the burning breeze that swept through some distant place at some distant time. But think about it. How powerful this image is of, of fire. And wind. It's a real powerful symbols. Well, the other day, we had gotten some, uh, we bought some new furniture for our deck. And uh, the furniture we had was this, uh, well, cedar that um, over the years, we'd had over 25 years, this table and benches and chairs. 
And every year, I would take overcoat stain, and I would, I would slather that on there, and it would look pretty good. But, but this year, I thought, eh, a little coat of stain is not going to work this year. It's just not going to happen. And uh, so I thought, you know, I don't think I'll be able to sell it on Marketplace. I probably can't put it on the curb and put a free sign in there. Probably nobody would take it because the table kind of warped a little bit and the, the bench is real loose and rickety. And so what I did is, uh, and it helped me take out a little aggression, actually. I had this, this hammer. I started tearing apart the table and the benches and, and then stacked them up in the fire pit. And it made for quite a pile in that fire pit. And then all it took was one of those, one, one of those uh, long Bic lighters and one flame and whoosh, started, started on fire. Man, I realized but quickly how dried out cedar can combust very fast. And then that wind that I didn't think was there before started coming up. And I had never seen flames come out, coming out of that fire pit ever before. I mean, it just was was lifting to the sky. And I was getting a little nervous because I had near that fire pit some wooden chairs. I thought, well, maybe I want to back those away a bit because, you know, they could catch fire. And as I was moving them away, I could feel how hot they were. And I thought, thank goodness I, <laughs> I moved those. Otherwise, they would have gone along with the, the, the other stuff. And... Uh, I had to keep a distance myself from the flame because the flame was so intense. Now, it's amazing how powerful a fire can get with some dried up wood and uh, some breeze or wind to, to help fuel that fire to encourage it along. And... Uh, I thought about it later. I thought about how this was a, uh, a great metaphor for the church. Now, this is, I think, also descriptive of what can happen or what had happened at Pentecost. The disciples, uh, even though they'd seen the risen Lord, He had ascended into heaven, I, I'm sensing they probably felt alone. They probably felt abandoned. And they're looking at one another, staring at each other, wondering, well, what do we do next? You know, anybody got any ideas? What's, what's going to happen next? They're probably kind of looking at, wonder, wondering, and looking at one another, what's going to happen next? And they were, at this point, I think that they were like that wood <laughs> that was all dried up. And I sense that their hope may have been dried up at that point as well. And then it happened all of a sudden, this sound like the, the, the rush of a violent wind came upon them and these tongues of fire began to descend upon them and they were ignited with the Spirit. And they began to each speak in their own languages. And there were devout Jews from every nation who were gathered there in Jerusalem together uh, and they heard this sound as the Galileans had moved from that that room out into the streets. And there they began to speak in these different languages of those who had gathered in Jerusalem. And they could all understand in the one meaning of the explanation of the great deeds of power of God. And it says that all were amazed and perplexed. And quite literally in the Greek it's a little stronger language in this. They were blown away. They were thoroughly disoriented and confused, totally uncomprehending. Now it's important to release the story from its 2,000 year domesticity that we've applied to it. Now when we say that we celebrate Pentecost, you know, of course we're celebrating the birthday of the church, so we treat it more like a, like a regular birthday, you know, complete with candles and cake, you know. But there's nothing calm or quiet about Pentecost at all. Kind of like that fire <laughs> in my fire pit. I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for those bricks that had surrounded that fire, 
who knows what would have happened. That wind would have taken the, that fire to the neighbors and then their neighbors. And who knows what have, would have happened in that neighborhood and that fire had, been, had not been contained. Now, it's our tendency, I think, to, to want to hold on to the Spirit. We want to contain it. We want to captivate it somehow. But we know in Scripture that the nature of the Spirit is that it, it goes, it, it blows where it wills, wherever it wants to. There's no harnessing it. You can't contain it. It, it rather moves us. And as it spreads, it spreads that flame of God's Word throughout the world. Now, if Pentecost is anything, it's about change. I know. I'm, I said that ugly word, change. Because as individuals, as institutions, we don't like change that much. We want to deny it or berate it or anything, but... but Oftentimes what we want to do is we want to go back to the good old days. Back to another time. But we know, we know deep down, we know we, we can't really exactly go back there. We can't set the clock back. There's no going back, even though we always want to go back. A wise and mischievous leader uh, in the church once made the comment that if as several church members had proclaimed with great hyperbole that there had been a golden age, then he blinked and he must have missed it. Now we know that we live in these changing often diff and often challenging time in which we live as a church throughout the world and especially in our American culture and society things aren't exactly the way that they used to be. Christianity or any other faith tradition for that matter um, you know, is not normative in America today. It's mostly those who have no connection with any organized religion. They're, they're, they're um, more prevalent than those who are connected with uh, some religious organization. Now, most of Christianity is aging, and we're not successfully reaching out to younger generations. And almost all mainline denominations are in a steady uh, decline in membership. Now, it's been said that the greatest obstacle to success, or future success, the greatest obstacle to future success is past success. Because from our mistakes, from our failures, we can learn from that. But in our successes, our successes can fool us into thinking, well, it worked in the past. If we continue to do that, it will continue to work, right? But it doesn't always work that way. It's like Peter in the Mount of Transfiguration who says, Lord, let's build three booths, one for you and one for Moses, one for Elijah, and let's just stay here forever. But Peter... You have to go down the mountain sometime. You can't stay there forever. And we spend years pining away for what we've left behind. And the golden age that appeared back then or there, past successes uh, all too often will hinder the Spirit's work. And God, and what God wants to do through us and with this church. The Holy Spirit had moved the disciples from sadness to joy, from survival to renewal, and the Holy Spirit empowered the followers of Jesus at Pentecost not to stay in the confines of that room where they had gathered, but they, the Spirit moved them out into the streets, into the world. And so, if anything, if anything that COVID, I think, has taught us in these difficult days, as a church, it's learning how to be adaptable. We've learned to adjust to this changing world and driven by our mission to utilize the technology to help hold the church together during this turbulent time. 
And in the meantime, in the process, I think the Spirit's been at work because we've reached a lot more people than we otherwise would have. Even in the midst of facing the challenges and the changes that are all around us, including the great changes and challenges within the church, the fire and wind of Pentecost cannot be extinguished. It continues on. Pastor Barbara Lundblad tells about how she was visiting with a friend of hers who uh, lived in New England, and she'd asked her friend, how is the church building program going? And uh, she said, oh, we ran out of money before we could get to the sanctuary, the worship space. And Lundblad thought to herself, what could be more important than the worship space? But she didn't say anything. She kept it to herself. She said, well, we renovated the basement. And you know, we have a shelter for homeless men in the basement. We put in new showers and uh, we've renovated the old kitchen. The basement was so drab and, and then we only had that one shower and that shower was, well, wasn't very good. Well, the Sunday before the shelter opened, the worship service began as usual. When it came time for Holy Communion, those who had gathered in the sanctuary moved down to the basement with the bread and the wine. And they gathered and circle around the empty beds and they shared the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That night, the shelter beds were full, and the worship space still needed a lot of work. And the church calendar said it was the first Sunday in Advent, but the people in the congregation knew that Pentecost wasn't over. That Pentecost was continuing to shape their lives and shape their mission and the church. Pentecost is not only a celebration of the birth of the church, but also is a celebration of the certain and sure promise that wherever the fire burns, wherever the wind blows, wherever chaos and life intersect, the Spirit of God is there, blowing where it wills and driving God's people even deeper into the mission that God has given to us. Amen. Let us stand for the hymn of the day. Together, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Gracious God, you give the Holy Spirit to your church, filling it with many and varied gifts, and the church throughout the world strengthen us in our visioning and dreaming that it may discover anew the Spirit's creative work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, your mighty works are too numerous to count. The earth is full of your creatures, living things both great and small. Open your hand and give them the necessities of this life. Send your fresh spirit over the face of the earth. Hear us, O God. God of the nations, at the sound of the rushing wind, people speaking different languages proclaimed and heard together your deeds of power. Fill the leaders of nations with your Holy Spirit so that they exercise your gracious will in the lives of people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. great. God of faithfulness, you tend to the needs of your people, even the sighs of our hearts. Hear those who cry out to you in distress. Restore to wholeness all who are in need this day, especially Dick Lawrenson, Kurt Legwald, Jerry Horizek, Tom Atkins, George Voller, John Wilhelm, Mae Jackson, Bill and Charles Stoltzman, and Wayne Senny, hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is great. great. God of love, fill this congregation with gratitude for the gifts we've received from you. Renew our ministries, heal our divisions, and open us to the needs of our neighbors. Bless Olivia Rose, who's receiving her first communion today, and strengthen her through the body and blood of our Lord. Hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is great. great. For our mission partners, Michael and Tammy in Italy, and our mission partners in Honduras, Russia, and India, that you would bless their ministry to many in need in those countries. Hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is great. great. For all those who serve our country in the military throughout the world, that your protective hand be upon them, especially Travis, Shane, Grant, Taylor, Andrew, Adam, Blake, Luke, and Gabe, hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of hope, those who have died and you raise their eternal song and praise, we give you thanks for the many gifts of your people and rejoice in the witness of your saints. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The the peace of the Lord be with you always. And And also also with you.
taste of all that is to come when all creation shares this feast with you. As the grains of wheat once scattered on the hill were gathered into one to become our bread, so may all your people from all the ends of earth be gathered into one in you. Let us pray. Merciful God, everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. We joyfully release what you have entrusted to us. May these gifts be signs of our whole lives returned to you, dedicated to the healing and unity of all creation through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Christ Jesus Christ. And the Spirit whom you poured out upon the church and on your people. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. holy, gracious, and merciful God, everything is filled with your glory. We give you thanks for your promise and presence which have sustained the faithful in this and every generation. Above all, we give you thanks for Jesus, born of Mary, who in word and deed announced your gentle rule of justice, reconciliation, and peace. On the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread broke it, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his command to love one another, his life and death, his resurrection and, and ascension. We pray for his coming again, even as we cry. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ has come, come again. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come. Amen. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that all your promises may come to us and your whole creation. Empower us by that same Spirit to love and forgive, that our lives may anticipate that day when you will make all things new. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that all your promises may come to us and your whole creation. 
Gather our prayers with those of the apostles, prophets, martyrs, and all the faithful who have gone before us and unite them with the unceasing prayer of the one who lives in us and in whom we live, Jesus Christ. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our friend. Christ with Christ in Christ, in the unity of the Spirit, our glory and honor be yours, O God, now and forever. Make us bold, O merciful God, to address you as our Abba, as we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, power and, and the glory, glory forever, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated as I invite those who are assisting with communion to come forward at this time. <clears throat>
Let us stand. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Praise to you, O God of mercy. Thanks be to you. We give you thanks to God for the blessings of this table. May our lives be made new by these gifts of grace, and may your love be made known through us. Amen. May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine on us and be gracious to us. May God look on us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Of presence 
Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.